everyone, welcome to Musical Orbit's webinar on Beyond Stage Fright. Uh, we have a specialist with us today who's a performance coach and creator of beyondstagefright.com, uh, which is a selection of interviews with famous musicians who have all suffered from performance nerves. Uh, you might think that, uh, oh, sorry, her name is Charlotte Tomlinson. Here she is. Hooray. <laughs> Hi, Charlotte. <laughs> you might think that, uh, you know, the most famous musicians in the world don't suffer from uh, performance nerves. That's just not true. You have a look at her site. It's, it's very revealing. Thanks so much for joining us today, Charlotte. It's really great to see you. Um, okay. Can you tell us a bit about you, how you first got into performance coaching? <laughs> you yourself suffer from performance anxiety. Um, well, how did I get into performance coaching? I think it's really an extension of teaching. I've taught for years and years and years. And what I was finding was that I was wanting to go beyond the normal way of teaching. Um, so I was wanting to find out if somebody was terribly anxious or if somebody was very tense. Um, I just felt that we couldn't really play the music until we actually had dealt with or at least explored what they were dealing with. And sometimes, sometimes you know, that 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 made an enormous difference and people would then be able to play their phrasing in Beethoven or whatever it was with much uh, greater ease than beforehand. Yeah. So did you suffer yourself um, as a child or as an adult from the wobbles? I don't think I've suffered unduly. I think, of course, I have. I think I'm like any other musician who has a dose of it. Um, and sometimes it gets too much and sometimes it's not too much. I do know though, and this is the thing that's really been very revealing, that the times that I've been paralyzed by nerves, and there have been two notable occasions, have been when I've been desperately concerned about getting it all right, feeling that I'm being judged, um, and feeling that I've let people down. So there are all sorts of psychological things that have really contributed to my nerves. Yeah, they're quite common ones, aren't they? Especially if you think about a job audition, uh, you know, or an exam um, or a concert where, you know, all your families come to watch. Um, incredibly hard to sort of switch off from that and just think, just think about the music. I mean, where do you start? Obviously, it's different with everybody, but um, how can you begin to address that? Well, that's a really good question because it, it needs a multi-pronged attack. It's not, there are no simple answers for this at all. I want to say that before I start because it, it's just, there's not a fix it kind of way of dealing with it. I think uh, long term, I would say one of the most important things is to build kindness into your practice. Um, and that's because when the, the, one of the things that really, really gets nerves, bad nerves off to a sort of very negative start is when, when you feel under pressure that you, you, you're being criticised or you're being judged and that's absolutely lethal for nerves. So that's a long pronged, long, long term um, way of dealing with it. Short term, there are all sorts of different ways. There are ways of dealing with nerves physically, um, how you actually manage your body in the physiological side, how you manage yourself emotionally just before you go on. There's so many different ways. Where do you want me to start? So when you say about kind, building kindness into your practice, are you talking about being kind to yourself or are you talking about other people's, your opinion of uh, other people's opinion of you? I think it all starts from yourself anyway. Uh, so yes, it's been kind to yourself. And I don't mean sort of wishy-washy, oh, that was lovely, because we don't tend to believe those kinds of things. It's actually being, it's the difference between, I say this in my book, it's the difference between um, being really down in yourself. So let me give you an example. If you've just played um, an F sharp and it's supposed to be a G, for example, it's a very simple, uh, simple one. Um, <clears throat> and you say, oh God, I'm such an idiot, I did this and I made that mistake. And it's like you're slapping yourself around the face and being really nasty. The kind of thing you'd never do to your best friend or you wouldn't do to your pupil, or at least you hope you wouldn't do to, to anybody. But we can do that to ourselves and it's built in on us, into us. And we've usually built it in for years and years and years. But if we can actually start changing very consciously so that instead of I'm such a stupid idiot for making this mistake, we say, oh, that was an F sharp, I needed to play a G. I wonder why I did that. Maybe if I used a different fingering, it would help. Do you see the difference? Yes. 
yeah much more positive um just to, just just to stop a second just to remind all of you who are watching if you want to send a question in please do use the question and answer function at the bottom of the zoom screen here you can ask your questions about your nerves to charlotte um, in fact we've got a question here from peter who says i get terrible bow shakes the minute my bow touches the string um I don't know whether he's a violinist or a cellist or viola, but um, he says, but I don't feel nervous before the performance. Any suggestions why this might be or what I could do about it? I mean, obviously you've not met him, you, you, you don't even know what instrument he plays, but have you had anybody with this kind of problem before? Yeah. I mean, nerves just strike in so many different ways. They tend to be very personal to the instrument. So um, a string player is going to more likely have to bow, have bow shakes than, than they are having something with their throat, which a singer would have. So it, that, will, that will be part of it. I, this is where it gets tricky because the, the way that I work with people is so unbelievably individual and it's also very intuitive. So if I saw him and I was standing in front of him and we were talking, I would be building a picture of what it is exactly that's happening and where that's come from. Um, what, what I've got right now is that he's just telling me that um, this is what happens and it's, it's just a demonstration of, of nerves happening. Um, so yeah, I'd have to talk to him more individually. I know that's not a very satisfying answer, no, but we need to find out what what it stems from, rather than I, yeah. I mean, I can give all sorts of tips of things that he could try because there's you know I've got a whole tool bag of different things that I can offer, um, and it and sometimes it's a case of sometimes it's a case of knowing your nerves, knowing how to handle your own nerves, and knowing that actually um whatever you're dealing with is is manageable if it's bow shakes, shakes and it's really having an impact on the music then that's not so manageable and there there need to be ways of man dealing with that and it might be a simple case let me give you one example it might be a simple case of doing something physical um because a bow, sh bow shakes when you're actually starting to play it's all sort of you know it's all honing in on the music and here i am in this situation Possibly it's just that the adrenaline has built up to that point and now it's all sort of zooming around your system and you need to diffuse more of it before you start. So, uh, I mean, this is something that I would say to anybody who says, okay, I am hyped up with adrenaline, there's too much of it, I can tell there's too much of it, what do I do? Um, and I've got, I can't demonstrate this unfortunately because of the way that you know, we're, we're on screen, but I can describe it. And that is um, to actually stand with your feet rooted to the ground and shake. So you're physically shaking excess adrenaline out of your system. And that's what it is, it's excess adrenaline, because what we want when we're performing is enough to enhance the performance, but not too much that the bow shakes or we feel terrible. We just want to find the right balance. And it might just be as simple as that, but it also could be rooted in all sorts of other things. Yeah. It does, of course, bring up that four letter word, beta blockers <laughs> at this point. I mean, obviously I've, I've known so many people in the profession who've, who've used them. Some who've used them successfully, some who are addicted to them and it becomes a real problem, of course, because then when they don't have them, uh, they freak out and can't play at all. Um, what are your, I can imagine what your feelings are, perhaps, what are your feelings on beta blockers, Charlotte? Well, it's very varied. It's a bit like the way, what you've just said. Um, some people have used them successfully, some haven't. I mean, I would say I don't, wouldn't want to judge anybody for using a beta blocker because there's nothing more terrifying than doing an audition as a professional musician, standing behind a screen, not knowing who's judging you, or, you know, you, your career depends on it. I mean, it's horrible. And maybe there is a place for a beta blocker here or there. And I know some people use it very carefully for that kind of thing, and it helps. But I think that the, the danger of beta blockers is what you said is the addiction. It's also the fact that some people talk about it numbing them out so that they're not connecting to the music as they want to connect. They're not expressing it as they want to express it. I would say it needs much, much better is to try and do the long term approach and start building in the kind, when I talk about the kindness, the, the more objective approach to practicing and performing um, where you're not beating up on yourself. So that you're trying to let go of this environment of criticism and judgment. Easier said, easier said than done, I'm, I'm really aware of that. But 
you know, there are ways of going about it. And obviously I can't say them all right now. I'd be working individually with people on this. Sure, sure. Uh, we have a question from Tamaki, who, um, she must be a teacher. She says, I have many pupils who are really scared of playing in public. How can I begin to help them overcome their fears? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, a particularly sort of, I mean, I have a six year old son who's terrified. He's so confident and, and wonderful in real life. And he, he, the thought of him going on a stage, he just won't do it. Absolutely refuses to do it. Why would he do this? This is a horrible thing for him. Um, yeah. how, how do you talk to those some people? Some people, yeah, I mean, some people really don't like it full stop. Some people actually love it and love the whole thing of, of, of performing, sharing music, but they have to manage it. So it's kind of finding which one you are. If you really hate it and, and you have terrible symptoms, then why put yourself through it unless there's something you're getting out of it? Um, <clears throat> okay, in terms of pupils, yeah, it's the same thing. It's sort of really supporting somebody in their whole practicing and learning in the way that I've been talking about. That's the long-term approach. Um, actually enabling performances to be something that are regular and easy and not too big and terrifying so for example if I mean a lot of teachers do this they have regular performances so maybe once a month they play to each other and this becomes a sort of very very normal thing that you don't just do it in your own practice room and that you're doing it with other people um, yeah, I think I think that's the first place I would start. There are all the sort of the physical side and all the rest of it. But I think I think for pupils, I think for younger people, um, this goes for anybody actually. It's terribly important for them to know how to prepare and know how to practice properly because uh, a kid who thinks they've done all the practice they need and then has that awful experience of going onto the stage and it's almost as if the spotlight is just going onto you and you go, oh, I don't know that bit, oh, I don't know that bit. That's very, very frightening. So a teacher, obviously, I mean, people, teachers do this, but need to support their pupils in really understanding how to prepare and that it's massively disproportionate the amount you have to prepare to the actual amount of time you're on that stage so i would say that's that's an important one for starters um as a professional violinist myself i have um great trouble when i'm when i'm playing solos not i'm in orchestra i have a great time i i love it and i'm enjoying the music and looking around at everybody else but i'm on my own i've a little voice in my head and when something goes wrong, that voice goes into overdrive. It's telling, oh, you did that wrong. Oh, how did, how, you shouldn't have done that wrong. Why have you done that wrong? And then, and as it's talking to me, I then make another mistake because yeah. I'm so distracted by that voice that's going on in my head. Got any tips for me, Charlotte? <laughs> that's the root of it all, in my opinion. I think that's where it all stems from. Um, yes, it needs to be practiced. As you practice your music, you need to practice soothing that voice so if you're just imagine that was your you have a six-year-old did you say yes yeah imagine that was your six-year-old son saying oh mom I, I, this is awful i can't do it i can't do it what would you say you'd be saying it's okay it's okay it's much better than you think it is it's really all right so whatever it is that makes you feel <sighs> soothed I would say the first thing is to soothe the tricky one with this is that it's very people say Oh, you've got to tell yourself you're great but that little voice in your head doesn't believe that yeah so you need to just do something it's almost like you have to go step by step with it until the end result is that you're telling us you're showing yourself that actually you really are very capable yeah. but in the moment you're saying it's okay it's okay it's like you're giving your son a hug you're giving yourself a hug and saying it's all right that's interesting because um, I, I imagine that might, you might say you have to shut that voice out, but you're not saying actually to shut it out. You're saying just to soothe it. No, because if you shut it out, it's like one of those things. If whatever you kind of fight against gets bigger. So if you actually just acknowledge it and go, oh, yeah, that's that voice again. Oh, Hi. and then say, oh, it's OK. It's all right. It's, it really is as you would as you would talk to your son. People are very good at talking to their best friends, their children, people they are really fond of and reassuring them and soothing them. It's so easy to do it to other people. Why do we find it so hard to do it to ourselves? 
<laughs> um, we have Clara asking, do you have any thoughts on why some people don't get nervous? That's a tricky one. I'm not actually sure. I think it can, again, I'd have to sort of talk to them and find out. Actually, no, that's not quite true. I have, and the number of times I've given sort of masterclasses and talks on nerves, and I've talked to people, um, there's always been one who said, I don't have nerves. <laughs> and then we actually do a little bit of digging. And we, what we find is that they don't have nerves before the performance or during, but they suddenly get into a complete bubble afterwards. Really? Yeah. So that's been my experience. Now, that's not necessarily the case with everybody, but it's been quite surprising. So I, I would be very surprised if um, there are people who really, really don't have them. If usually what people have in a very healthy way is a sort of anticipatory, you know, quite excited expectation, looking forward to butterflies, oh, that kind of thing. That that, if you can call that nerves. Um, but but if people don't really really don't have nerves, then there's not that heightened sense of anticipation about a performance and very often a lot of people I know including myself would be very would not be happy to have nothing at all because it means you're not really your performance is not being enhanced yeah there's um, a very famous principal flautist who I'm friends with who um, just seems to have nerves of steel I've never ever heard him have a, a wobbly nose or anything ever and I said to him once uh, you know, how do you do that then? I, how, do, how do you not get nervous? And he said, oh, I get nervous. I absolutely get nervous. And the, the way my nerves manifest themselves is that I go into the zone and I become very, sort of, it's this sort of white heat and I'm really in the moment. So it's obviously a very positive thing for him, but the nerves are very much there. He's using them to his advantage though. He's really and that's fine. That's absolutely fantastic because that's the thing. It's like you learn over time to gather that energy, gather that adrenaline, which and then to get it to work for you rather than to, to, to go out of control. And I think that's that's where the looking after yourself and being kind to yourself and your practice and building that in over you know days, weeks, months, years can really support that. And then of course, yes, focus, 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 focus. Yeah. Um, so you did this wonderful um, uh, website, beyondstagefright.com, uh, which was a series of interviews. Uh, tell us about, you tell us about it. Tell us what, where you got the idea from to, to oh, all these famous Well, people. yes. I mean, it's, it's the idea sort of popped in as ideas pop in. And um, it's actually, it's, it's an American kind of template. They do a lot of these things. And once I started it and I got the name Beyond Stage Fright and I started contacting musicians and realizing there was enormous enthusiasm for it and interest. And then I was lucky because Hilary Hahn said yes straight away. And of course, then that gave a certain credibility to the whole project. Um, and people started coming, not quite in droves, but started being very keen to be part of it knowing that it was going to be an okay thing to do um but yes it was absolutely fascinating to interview people like her john lill martin roscoe all sorts of you know fascinating good musicians um including a writer and a teacher and various other people um and i learned so much and so much about how people just manage themselves. I mean, Hilary Hahn was fascinating because, I mean, she was a child prodigy and it was, you know, she said that when she went to Curtis at the age of 10, um, she said those few years were the most scary for her when she was playing in front of her contemporaries, her colleagues. Um, and when I said things to her like, but since then, it's much, it's become easier and e not easier and easier, but she's managed it more and more. And she's obviously got a way of doing, of, of, of performing that, that works for her. Um, but I, one of the things that stands out in my mind so when I talked to her was, um, I said to her, how do you keep your focus on stage? Because if you ever see Hilary Hahn performing, and I saw, saw her play a Sibelius violin concerto, it was as if nothing would take her from that music and I said to her look if a bomb went off or an alarm you know fire alarm went off in the hall I don't think you would have noticed and she just smiled because actually I don't think she would have done she would have just gone on she had she'd 
like the principal process that you're talking about, she has learned to gather that energy and really put it into what she's doing. Yeah. You can watch these. Can we watch these um, interviews online at the moment or are they being re-released? I've put them all back online. They're all free and I haven't got any plans to take them off. Um, so you just have to go to beyondstagefright.com, put your name and your email address in and then you get, you'll get an email from me or automated email from me with the uh, link that you click on. Then you've got the whole access to 21 of them. Right. And some more coming, some more interviews. Uh, well, that's what I'm, I'm planning. I'm hoping that I can kind of uh, capitalise on, on the last one and get some really, really interesting people. So it's Watch This Space. If any of you would like to have your own session with Charlotte um, to discuss any performance nerves problems you have, uh, you can do it through Musical Orbit. Hooray! Um, if you search for her um, and find a musician uh, and a performance coach, you'll see her there and you can book your own slot with her. Uh, which will be through the computer online or if you happen to live near her where do you live charlotte oxford oxford oxford, oxford england if you happen to live near there or are passing through sightseeing then you can uh, make an appointment to see her then as well thank you so much charlotte for joining us today it's great to get the subjects out here and talking about it and hopefully we'll be able to do it again soon lovely thank you very much thanks very much bye everybody bye